So, good morning. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here so early and for your teachers for giving up their time. Um, so, today we have with us Dr. Angus Scrimger, who is from the Natick Labs. Okay. He is, I have to get this right, a nutritional biochemist in the Military Nutrition Division at the U.S. Army Research Institute in Environmental Medicine. Whew. Okay, so he comes from South Africa and he got his master's in physiology and sports medicine at the University of Cape Town. And then he came to New England and worked on his PhD at the University of Vermont, which was in cell and molecular biology. Okay. From that, he has now transferred his work to protecting our soldiers. And his main goal is um, you know, developing animal prototypes, models, um, especially for traumatic brain injury and how can nutritional supplements help with um, rapid or more rapid improvement. And from there, hopefully, um, some sort of prevention, correct? Can I, is that a, okay. So from here, because there's a lot of words on the introduction that I cannot say, and <laughs> your science teachers would be really embarrassed. So I'm going to leave it to Dr. Scrimger, and feel free to raise your hand when you have a question, because I know he would love to answer that. Okay? Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Ms. Honey. Um, Good morning. I'm glad to see you all awake. I only had one coffee. If your phone rings, I will answer your phone, if it helps. Um, if I say something that you don't understand, raise your hand. Miss Honey asked me to speak to you today about what I do in my job. I'm a government scientist. I don't wear a uniform. I'm not in the military. I work for the soldiers. So I, I don't salute. I don't carry a gun. My work is to help the U.S. soldier perform better. So if I can improve his night vision by 2%, or get him 2% less diarrhea when he goes overseas, or I can make his bones 2% stronger, and I can do it through nutrition, that's my main objective. So in Natick, where I work, we develop the soldier rations. So when I was a faculty member at University of Virginia doing diabetes research, I have type 1 diabetes, the events of 9-11 happened. So we're talking about back in 2001, September 11th, when we had the attacks on the World Trade Center. And I looked at my American wife and I said, I'm getting out of here. I'm going back to Africa. These Americans are going to start a war. I was right. But the dean challenged me and said, you got your PhD in America. Why don't you try to help the Americans in this time of need? So he found me the job in Massachusetts with the US Army. So I'm now a US citizen. So to help me sleep well at night, I believe, I'm trying to help the soldiers improve their immunity, make them a little bit stronger. So I'm going to talk today about two examples, work I did in Kenya. I'll tell you why we went to Kenya for three years to study diarrheal research. When our soldiers grow up in Northborough and they drink Dasani water and there's fluoride in, the, in the, your drinking water, you never get an intestinal challenge. You don't get diarrhea here anymore because we've got rid of it. Our soldiers go to foreign countries. We don't invade Canada. We go to places with bad water. And diarrhea is the number one problem for US soldiers when they go overseas not getting shot by the enemy. So we can develop vaccines if we know what the bug is. But if tomorrow we have to go to North Korea, let's say, we don't even know what's in their drinking water. To carry water is heavy. On my property, we develop backpacks for soldiers. And they would rather carry bullets than extra food or extra water. Think about that. With lots of food and not enough bullets, he's dead, but he's got a full tummy because he ran out of bullets. So they would rather come back hungry. So we fight to combat muscle wasting in soldiers, adding extra proteins, specific kinds of proteins to the rations. In my field, we work on diarrhea, and that's what I'll talk about today. I was in Yomo Kenyatta Airport in Nairobi, and my boss called me, and he said, what do you know about TBI? I said, oh, is that a new kind of diarrhea? He said, no, TBI is traumatic brain injury. You've seen this in the, in the, in the papers. You've seen it on TV because of the Patriots. When a, when a football player runs into a wall or runs into Gronkowski and he gets a traumatic brain injury. And it's happening to young girls in your soccer fields getting traumatic brain injury. And we have 
nothing but ibuprofen to give our soldiers. So they asked me, what can we do through nutrition? So I'm, those are my two examples I'm going to cover today. I've got you for almost an hour. I hope I can keep you awake. And I can hope I give you some ideas of what you're studying today in AP chemistry or biochemistry or biology, maybe some math, where it helped me in my career. Got it? So I, I, put, I threw this one in. Miss Honey alluded to some of this. But I started in, how does this work? I started at University of Edwardesrand. That's just, it's a big university in Johannesburg. I did a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. We don't use the term BS because it sounds different. We say BSc, Bachelor of Science. Okay, got it? That was a joke. <laughs> then I did an MSc degree, master's degree in physiology, working with kids with diabetes. I, I speak Zulu, so I was able to go into the black townships where kids die from diabetes. So we ran exercise programs. With that experience, I interviewed at the University of Vermont. I did a PhD, again, working on diabetes at, in muscle. And then I did, when you, like when you go to medical school, you do a residency, an internship. I went to the NIH, which is in Bethesda, Maryland, National Institutes of Health. And I did a postdoctoral fellowship. And then I went down to University of Virginia. And that's where I told you things happened in 9-11. And since then, I've been at the Military Nutrition Division at the US Army Research Institute for Environmental Medicine. So we study heat, what it does to our soldiers, cold when we go to Alaska, and altitude. So we have the world's highest lab in Pikes Peak, Colorado, at 14,300 feet above sea level. But we can only go there for three months of the year to study altitude effects. So we have, a a, we have buildings in our build, we have a chamber in our building where we can close the door and suck out the atmospheric pressure. We can take them to high altitude. So then I'll get into what I did with in Reichweich in the Netherlands. I was gone for 18 months learning how to use explosives S because our rats, our soldiers, don't just get hit from car accidents. They get exposed to blast explosives. So I wanted to have the best model. Please understand, I'm not in the business of fixing busted rats. I use rats as my model. My customer is a busted soldier. So I can't expose a soldier to a blast. Get it? So we use the animal as a surrogate. So if you think I'm, I'm chairman of the Animal Care Committee, so I look at this and I say each animal has to count. So understand that if I'm doing diabetes research and using animals, maybe it's a waste because we've used too many animals. But for blast research, I cannot use, are you going to volunteer for a blast study and, and get, ex no. So I use the animals and I'll, I'll show you what we've done. All right. So the outline of my talk looks like this. I'll tell you how and why, what we do for research. I'll show you what we did in animal models and then we went to Kenya, what we're doing in brain studies, and what we're doing today. Medical command of the guys who do all the hospitals. We're under medical research material command and there's six labs. And we're, this is the name of our lab. So this is really just a structure how we fall under the Army Surgeon General. Um, I want to thank your parents for paying their taxes, because your parents' money is what pays my salary. So I'm working at the will of the government, and the government can tell me what to do. This is our building. This is our property in Natick. It kind of looks like the shape of Texas. We are surrounded by Lake Kachichuit, which used to be beautiful, and they used to make beer out of this water. But it's US Army, so we've polluted the water. It's horrible. You can't swim in this lake anymore. We're located in Natick, which is on mile 10, when you run from Hopkinton to Boston on the Boston Marathon. OK. We're in four divisions. I'm in the military nutrition division. These guys look at injuries, military performance, and how we can reduce bone fractures. Thermal Mountain, I told you about the guys who do heat and cold. And we, and we test gloves. We test backpacks. Biophysics, biomedical modeling, this is the kind of stuff you take a lot of data, you put it in a mathematical model, and we say you fell off a boat off North Carolina, when does it go from search and rescue to get you alive to search and recovery when we find your body? So we can put in the wind, the prevailing wind temperature, the water currents, we can put that into a model. And so they're doing a boatload of work to help the soldier. Got it? All right. <clears throat> so under what we do in our building, this is recovery and nutrition. When you're in the field, I told you, the soldier doesn't want to carry extra nutrition, extra food, because food is heavy. So what we can focus on is recovery and nutrition. Think of running the marathon. 
your marathon is planned. You know you're running 10K on Saturday morning, so you eat a boatload of pasta on Friday night. But for the soldiers, he's deployed, and he's working 24-7. So what can we put in his backpack for recovery and nutrition? Resilience. Are there ways we can prevent disease? Um, my work is preclinical, that means in animals, to improve tolerance and recovery from traumatic brain injury. So I told you, we've done a lot of drug studies in animals, and they work fantastic in animals, but nothing translates to the humans. So we're, in a, we're a gap, so we identify gaps in knowledge, and that's where they stuck me. All right. So what directs our research? How do, how do I find out what I'm supposed to be doing? And I'll show you a list. So we gave this to the army physicians, and we said, tell us what's important. And they all sat around the table, 98 physicians, army physicians, sat around the table and kind of voted and said, this is what this, the soldier needs most. And usually at the top of, top of that list will be something like hemorrhage, because soldiers bleed. So are there ways we can have blood? Blood is heavy. And if I'm a combat medic, I've got to carry a pack of blood for you. And then maybe it's the wrong kind of blood. So understand, blood is always at the top, one and two. So on this list is my first example is prevention of diarrheal disease, and two is traumatic brain injury. So the work I'm trying to do is in the top 10 of what is needed by the soldier. So they're not, this, the government is not gonna fund something that's number 99 on this list. So try to focus your work on what's important for the soldier. <clears throat> so we'll get, go through some examples of zinc and diarrhea, and you ask how big is the problem? And what I said to you in the beginning was diarrhea is the number one non-battle related injury for our soldiers. So this is a study we did in Bahrain, and we looked at soldiers coming from Afghanistan and from Iraq for six years. And we looked for those of the six years, and we asked how many soldiers were involved. Two million soldiers had been deployed for six months. 145,000 had been deployed for only 19 days. That's special forces. They live in North Carolina, and they deployed for six days. They do a special mission. They come home. So they drink in normal water in North Carolina, and then they go to a foreign country and get diarrhea. Now, how bad is the diarrhea? 3.8 million cases. A diarrhea day is when you're confined to barracks. So we've sent 14,000 soldiers to war, and 11 million days were spent in the barracks. You could not fight. If you're concerned about how big your hospital needs to be, we've got pretty good numbers. And look at the number of duty days lost. Over a million duty days where a soldier is standing down. If you're doing logistics, that's how much IV fluid you've got to take. And if you're concerned about budgets, that's a boatload of money. So the way I read this is 1.1 million duty days lost divided by the number of days over six years. That tells me per day there are over 500 soldiers unable to fight. And that could be important. If you're at a FOB, a forward operating base, and there's only eight of you guys, and one guy's got the diarrhea, and we don't even know what bug caused the diarrhea. So this is kind of important. So how, what do you do? You guys know this. You do a literature search, see what's out there. So you go to Bangladesh, and you find out that if you give a zinc supplement, you can work on Shigella diarrhea. But these are kids in Bangladesh. In the country of Bangladesh, the Ganges River floods. And not the town, not the county, the whole country. We give them zinc every day, and it costs two cents per kid. Mortality goes to zero. That means no kids die from diarrhea anymore in Bangladesh because of diarrhea, and it's Shigella. And Shigella is what our soldiers are getting. Then you go look at a meta-analysis. Do you guys know what that is? It's when there's been 18 different studies, some guy who doesn't do research, but he's a math guru, puts it all together and does a sum summary study. So now we're at a place where we can do meta-analysis on the effects of oral zinc in the treatment of diarrhea. But the army doesn't do this. All of the army's money is on vaccines. They said, Angus, what can you do about this? So we set up a study. This is East Africa. Anyone here from Africa? This is East Africa, so the equator runs just north of Kisumu, runs across there. So we fly into Nairobi, and we catch a small plane up to Kisumu. And if you've never been here, it's because the buses don't go here. This is the diarrhea capital of the world. 
all right? So this helps me pick a place to go. I can't go into the war zone where they got the diarrhea. I've got to find a place where there's adults and they have the diarrhea and they're the same age as our soldiers. So the question my boss asked me was, why Kenya? They got high diarrhea. They got Shigella diarrhea. Our soldiers in Afghanistan get Shigella. Southern Iraq, they get Shigella. <clears throat> oh, and it's antibiotic resistant. So remember when you see your pediatrician and your pediatrician says, take another antibiotic, take another antibiotic. This is one of the problems of that is you, get, you start to develop antibiotic resistance. They don't have clean water. And the US Army's been doing malaria vaccines there for about 40 years. So we spent three years going back and forth to Kisumu to run studies. In addition, 80% of the people have malaria at any time. So there's evidence to show that giving zinc pushes your immunity and you could maybe have less episodes of the malaria fevers. And these people are micronutrient deficient. So we take dietitians and the dietitians say, hey, how much do you, I see you grow tomatoes. How much tomatoes do you eat? They don't eat the tomatoes. They sell the tomatoes to make money. They eat the tomato plant. That's how much poverty there is in this area. Got it? So we're coming in and we're doing a nutrition intervention. We're giving them zinc, we're giving them vitamin A to boost their immunity against diarrhea. That was our study. So it was a big study. We went to see the effect of zinc on reducing travelers' diarrhea. It was a four-month study. We did three months taking a zinc or placebo. Do you guys know what a placebo is? So it's the same carrier material. And it's not going to give you diarrhea, but it's missing the zinc. And then we wanted to see, we're giving this to a soldier every day, but then he gets deployed and he doesn't get a supplement. So we studied them for another month. This meant meeting with your patient every day and asking them, how was your diarrhea? You guys are smart. You go to Algonquin. And if I ask you how many bowel movements you had last weekend, you're not going to remember. So we needed to meet with them every day. So it was labor intensive. It was a huge clinical study. All right. So we briefed 1, 1,000 people. We got consent forms, we screened them, that means drawing blood, and we randomized five, 250 people got placebo. This is a clinical study. This is how things are done. At the end, we got guys who dropped out. So I'm sitting in Natick, Massachusetts, and they call me and they say, oh, we admitted one of your patients to the hospital. He was ingesting alcohol products. That means he was maybe stealing gasoline and some of it went down his throat. No, he was taking gasoline to get high. So he drops out the study. So we have things that don't happen in, in, in Northborough when you run a clinical study. We got quite a good study here with 228 in that group, 229 in this group. And I'm going to show you some chemistry now. Work with me. There's many kinds of zinc. When you buy, when you go get a zinc lozenger for cough, you're going to get zinc gluconate. When you go to the beach and you put stuff on your nose, that calls zinc oxide. So chemistry, there are different kinds of, of zinc. Think about this. I want to give them the zinc that's going to work for the diarrhea. If I give them zinc oxide, it's low bioavailability, means it's not absorbed. You guys know this because you put it on your nose when you go to the beach. But it's cheap. So cost is a factor. What percentage of zinc? That means it's zinc and oxygen, or it's zinc and gluconate, or it's zinc and carbonate. So we ended up picking zinc sulfate, it's recommended, it's used by the World Food Program with refugees. So we put this stuff into medicine, and that's what the capsules look like, and we buy this stuff and we import it into Kenya. So we go do a study. This is a concern. Colonel Boval is measuring mid-upper arm circumference to give an idea of percent body fat. And what we're classifying people is whether they're underweight or normal weight, overweight or obese. And we would expect to see normal weight or underweight in a country with nutritional deficiencies. But notice I've circled, we got 48% of the people, of the females, are overweight or obese. How does that happen in a country with micronutrient deficiencies? People who are starving. And a lot of it has to do with what we call misnutrition. They're getting the calories. They're eating french fries. But they're eating the wrong kind of calories. So in our, our work there, we also have to educate the people on what's a good food to eat. All right. All right, are you guys tracking with me? Are there any questions? Am I, do I still have your attention, right? So we're about halfway through.
So don't, don't, don't give up on me. So we draw blood on these guys. Now, if I come into this clinic, into this room, and you're all my subjects, and I start giving you a zinc supplement, it's possible that I might cause an iron deficiency because I'm giving you extra zinc, which is a divalent cation, and you, maybe you become calcium deficient or you become iron deficient or something else. So you go measure calcium, copper, um, iron, potassium, magnesium, manganese, selenium, zinc. We've got really high rates of manganese because these guys drink tea every day. It's called milk tea. They boil milk and they add tea to it. So we wouldn't, we, this was unknown, this was new for us that that. When I give you zinc in the black, you go from being deficient at the beginning, you get a surplus afterwards. So our zinc was effective in raising blood zinc, but we also didn't want to cause other deficiencies. So the Hippocratic Oath, if you're thinking about medical school, the Hippocratic Oath, the first thing is, first, do no harm. So I gotta be careful, I'm going into a foreign country, I'm a Muzungu, I'm a white guy here with my native brain, and I'm coming into Western Kenya, and I'm saying, this is gonna help you, this is gonna cure everything, and then I cause a different problem. So the takeaway from this slide is to say we were effective in raising blood zinc levels, and we didn't cause other deficiencies, got it? So don't do harm. Now you ask, so what happened to diarrhea? So we look at that, and what you see over three months, month one, month two, month three, the diarrhea went up because of the rainy season, and then it came down. Up because this is incidence and prevalence. Do you guys know the difference? When we talk about incidence, the word incidence means how many bouts of diarrhea each month. So we're talking about half a diarrhea per month or one diarrhea per month during the rainy season and then down to half. Over here is diarrhea prevalence, diarrhea days each month. So how do you measure that your zinc was effective in reducing diarrhea in this population? Well, you ask them every day, and then you score it, and you run the stats. So one, is your diarrhea gone from five days down to three days or two days? Are you getting three bouts over the season or two bouts over the season? There's different ways, and that's what this is. We're looking at this. My concern, and what you should notice is, there's no difference between the two groups, the placebo and the zinc and the placebo and the zinc. Dang, Angus, what did you do? <laughs> it didn't work. You spent a boatload of money. We sent you and all your soldiers to Kenya. You were there for th back and forth for three years, and you had no effect. What did you do wrong? So now you've got to get the statisticians to help you and explain what's going on. So remember I told you there were guys who had HIV, guys who had malaria, guys who were co-infected. So we started looking at this and seeing which group, maybe there were groups that were resistant, groups where the zinc didn't help because they already had zinc, or they had a kind of diarrhea that doesn't respond to the zinc. And really what I'm showing you in this is, here's the group of healthy people, no change in diarrhea prevalence. HIV, no change between the zinc and the placebo group. Here it looks like diarrhea got better on the placebo. The co-infected. Co-infected means you got HIV and you got malaria. You have a pretty messed up immune system. So when I read that, I'm hoping, yeah. When I read that, and I see it down here for incidence and for, if Angus is sitting at Yomo Kenyatta Airport in Nairobi and I got one bag of zinc, who are you gonna give it to? Apparently it doesn't have a health, healthy people won't benefit, HIV, it's the co-infected group. So if you're from the world health organization, and you need to prioritize who's gonna get your zinc. It's clear to me that the people who are mean deficient will benefit from the zinc, all right? So then I asked a different question. If we take the guys, here's everybody's zinc, and that's where the average was before, and that's where the average was afterwards. So it went up a little bit, nice. But there's a group that is zinc deficient. Did these guys benefit the most? I'm trying to identify my population, who should get a zinc supplement? And what we got is we took those groups, and it looks like there's less dots there than here. So I'm saying, wow, more of these guys moved up. They benefited over 90 days. And this is what we see, that diarrhea went down if you took zinc. So bingo, I've told you co-infected people will benefit, and I've told you that um, if you were zinc deficient in the beginning. Makes sense, right? All right, so we got a different problem. I told you about clean water. 
and that our soldiers come from New Hampshire and they drink Dasani water. You guys know when you go on spring break down to Jamaica, there's two kinds of kids who come back from Jamaica. If you dr brush your teeth with Diet Coke, you don't get the diarrhea. If you brush your teeth with the local water, you're going to get Giardia diarrhea. And we have no vaccine for that. So remember that when you go to college and you go to spring break and you come back with diarrhea, you'll be like, that army guy told us, brush your teeth with Diet Coke. So this is important because your source of water, where you get clean water from, is real important. So we asked them, where's your water come from? This is an open well. This is a pump. You pay five cents. He unpadlocks the, the pump and he pumps water in here. This well had a ferret kind of thing lying down in the bottom in the water. So it ferret, an animal had fallen in and drowned. So the water source is not very clean. So we asked them, this is our field area with all the clinics. That was my headquarters. Here's the road to Uganda. So I said, wow, here's Lake Victoria. And maybe they get more clean water down here from the lake. The mountains are up here. Just follow me with this. We're looking at how much diarrhea is in each of these six places versus how much diarrhea is down here. So we drew a line. And we said, how's the diarrhea up here? The mountains are to the north, and clean water is running down through these towns. My clean water comes from the stream above me. My dirty water leaves and goes down there, but it's the next guy's clean water. Got it? So the guy down here is getting really dirty water. So we would expect the diarrhea to be lower down by the water. What's really cool is that the babies down here all have bigger heads because they get fresh fish out of the lake in their diet. And with fresh fish, fresh protein, you get a bigger head. You grow better with protein. But the diarrhea is worse. So this is telling you diarrhea below the road where the water is dirty, but there's high protein. And diarrhea above the road is significant. That means less than 0.05 means it's significantly lower diarrhea if you live up north. Got it? So we're tracking where to send our soldiers. If we're sending our soldiers down here, then you've got to take your own clean water or take a pump from REI to clean the water. If you're going to work up here and you're a missionary working for the, the Mormons, then maybe this is where you want to put your house at night and drink water up here because it's cleaner water. All right. So I'm wrapping this up. Are you guys tracking? Are you staying with me still? So what happened? It looks like zinc had no effect on morbidity. That means um, how bad it was. We didn't kill anybody. That's good. But no effect on morbidity to reduce the incidence of diarrhea. It didn't do much to malaria. We were not giving them pharmacological doses, physiological, stuff you can get from your diet. It increased plasma zinc, and it didn't cause any damage. It did not affect iron. So in women, we did not cause an iron deficiency. All right. Zinc may reduce diarrhea and malaria in people who have malaria, have HIV and malaria. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we need. Can you guys track? Can you see what that is? All right. So when you have a communication problem, think about this. We go in and we go to defense language school and we go to learn Swahili, the stuff you know from Akuna Matata. You go to learn Swahili. And we find out the place we were working, they don't speak Swahili. They speak Dalua language. So miscommunication is important. And on that chart, that's a poop chart, right? You can point and you can ask the guy, what does your poop look like? And get it without collecting samples. Because I promise you, the samples will scare you. When you see the tapeworms crawling in the poop, it's not fun. And then you put it on FedEx and you send it back to Natick. All right? Not cool at all, because the people in Natick were racist at my base. They said, no, this is African blood. This is African poop. We don't want it. I said, whoa, you guys go out and train, because your blood, my blood, should all be treated. Don't, don't, don't be upset. Your, your blood, all your blood should be the same that you wear gloves. It's called pe personal protection. You wear gloves when you're treating. Don't say it because it's from Africa. It's, it's infectious. It's dangerous blood. So instead of bringing poop back to America, we just brought blood back. All right. Okay, I'm wrapping this piece up. When our soldiers go, and we don't know where they're going tomorrow. So they may go to Haiti when there's an earthquake or a tsunami. 
They may go to Venezuela because it's corrupt and they're not doing so good over there. We have a presence now in Africa, it's called AFRICOM, and most of it is up in the north in the Sahel, up here and in West Africa. And the diarrhea here is ETEC, enterotoxigenic E. coli. This is Giardia diarrhea, we don't have a vaccine. When they go to Afghanistan or Iraq, it's, I told you, Shigella diarrhea. When they go to Burma, it's, um, it's a whole different form. They'd study it in monkeys out of, out of Thailand. And when, if we go to North Korea, it says zero. We don't know what's going on, what their soldiers will get infected with. So the point I'm trying to make is that if we send our soldiers to a country where you don't have medical intelligence, you don't know what the soldiers are going to face, you're going to run into a lot of trouble. And, and I guess the way to say it is you're going to be in the because the soldiers will drink the water and they will get the diarrhea and you have no preventive me medicine. All right. So I told you I was in Yomo Kenyatta Airport and my boss called me and he said, can you study TBI? And I thought it was a form of diarrhea. I'm a poop doctor. He said, no, no, no. TBI is traumatic brain injury. Can, we're going to switch you over. So I have a PhD in cell biology. I don't study the brain. So this is a whole new paradigm for me, but it's something important for the soldiers. So they said, can you take your expertise and help the soldier? So the first question I told you earlier, you do a literature search. You go find out how bad it is. Because if I'm going to modify the rations for three soldiers, I'm wasting money. If it's three million soldiers, it's a serious problem. We've got to do something. So look at this graph. Just work with me here. We're tracking from the start of the war was in 2003. And these are the number of cases of traumatic brain injury over every three months. And look at these numbers, and look what I've circled there. 630 soldiers per month are being exposed to a blast. That's a bucket of soldiers with traumatic brain injury. So yeah, it's not three a guy. It's important, and we're spending boatloads of money. How much money? In January of this year, we had spent $904 million dollars on $904 million on traumatic brain injury research, and all we have to give them is ibuprofen. So how bad is it? This is what you guys get. When, you play, when the woman plays soccer, they're getting mild TBI, and it's 82% of that number. That's how many soldiers have TBI. 82% is mild. A very small, this penetrating means a bullet wound. Severe means like a motor vehicle accident, that's worse. This is under like what you call concussion. So this is the area I work in with these guys. But you can see it's a boatload of people. This, I, will, I won't stay on this for too long. This is to show you that since 1980 through to 2009, they've done about 40 clinical trials and none have gone to business, none have gone to market as a drug for TBI. So this is to identify the gap in knowledge, what's missing, why we've got to do TBI. So the problem we have is there's no ration component to enhance recovery of your behavior, your memory losses, your, your inability to sleep, your suicidal thoughts following exposure to a mild TBI. So you have a soldier. This is my cartoon, I apologize. You have a soldier. He's exposed to a blast. That's called an improvised explosive device, IED. He starts getting concussion symptoms. Much later, he gets this dis dysregulated neurogenesis. The brain doesn't recover. And then we start having these cognitive deficits. And you can think about this in our football players. They get whacked on the head when they're 23 and 24. They retire when they're 25 with a whole lot of money. And at age 42, Junior Say committed suicide because he couldn't, un he couldn't handle the stuff going on in his head. The BU lab, the brain bank lab at Boston University Medical School, is looking at the brains of boxers, of professional athletes, to try to understand CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That's the disease in your brain we can only diagnose after you're dead. So this is all the same business. So one, the work I'm doing might have a benefit to the civilian population. So we think that if I did dietary zinc, and I'll tell you why, Maybe before, that would be protection, or maybe immediately afterwards, that would be acute, or much later, would be chronic. And I'll tell you why we think this might work. So we did a study to see if zinc supplementation would improve resiliency, would 
boost your protection, your neuroprotection. I'm going to use this term non-blast, and I'm going to use the term blast. Non-blast is motor vehicle accidents, girls playing football, uh, um, um, head injuries, head, uh, head bumping in soccer, and um, what we call combatives in the military. So we have a significant population here at home who get head injuries, just as, it, as you get on the field. So this is a machine called a cortical contusion impactor, and it's nasty. You make a hole in the head, you whack the rat on the head. Sounds horrible. Please understand, I can't ask soldiers to volunteer for my studies. So use the rat as a surrogate. But a rat is not a soldier. A rat has a slanted head. The rat will recover by himself within about a year. So the rat has the ability to naturally recover. But if you're 16, 17, you might already be too old that your brain won't recover. So what do we do with a 22-year-old soldier with blast? Is there something in the diet we can do to enhance his recovery? So you got it. I'm trying to combine nutrition, have an excuse and an understanding of the nutrition for the biochemistry, how it would benefit, and then I put it into a ration component for the soldier. So what we do is a rat, think of pediatrics. A rat won't tell you how he's feeling, just like a baby kid or a veterinary at the veterinary clinic. I'm feeling depressed. So I, what I do in my lab is I design mazes to test memory and learning and anxiety and depression. We can do this. This is a swimming tank, just like a kid's swimming pool. And under the water is a stand. So I put the rat in here, or in here, or in here, or in here, and he learns to swim around until he finds that stand. So he does it. we do this for five days. He's in the water for three minutes, and he learns that he's supposed to go find that stand. He's got cues on the wall telling him to find that. So it's called memory. And the first time he's in the water, rats hate water. First time he's in the water, it takes him about two minutes. It gets better and he gets better. By Friday, it's 12 seconds. He finds that stand. Then I hit him on the head, cause brain damage. And a month later, I put him back in the water. But then I move the stand. I put the stand over here. We call this new learning. What am I trying to do? The soldier is in Afghanistan and he knows what's happening back home. When he gets hit and he comes back to Boston, his girlfriend's left him, he's rowdy at work and he loses his job and he rolls his truck and he's suicidal. We're saying, can the nutrition help you with new learning? Got it? So we put the rat and we simulate what the soldier's going through. And this is what it looks like. Here's day one. You put the rat in here and we can track him with a video. And we can see until he never finds the, the stand is over here. By the end of the week, it takes him less than 10 seconds to find the stand under the water. It's, it's hidden about an inch under the water. So you can train a rat how to find your stuff. And this is how we score it. On day one, here's the group that's sham. These guys didn't get a head injury. So it takes him 50 seconds. By the end of the week, it's taken him about eight seconds to find the, the hidden platform. Here's the guys that have TBI, traumatic brain injury, up there. And they're on a zinc adequate diet. This in red, I've highlighted it, they got a zinc supplemental diet. They did significantly better. Zinc helped fix the brain. If you guys work with me, in chemistry, A plus B goes to C plus D. Got it? You got reactants, you got products. Zinc is a coenzyme on about 220 biochemical reactions. When you're low on zinc, because you have diarrhea, you can't make product. You can't fix the system. So we're supplementing zinc in the diet. So this tells me it works in an animal model. So we published this stuff. And then I said, well, that's non-blast. Let's go look at blast. So I moved my whole family, and we went to outside The Hague. We were down in Reichweig, and we went to learn how to use explosives. Uh, Miss Honey came to visit me and, and my family. She's, she's actually my neighbor. Um, now, I'm going to show you guys a little bit of what happens. And it's not pleasant. But I preface this all by saying I'm not in the business of fixing busted rats. My customer is a busted soldier. What's the best way to mimic what's going on with the soldier? I went to learn how to use explosives. I have a tube. I detonate explosives. So I blow up all day. That's what I do, is I detonate explosives and I cause brain damage. So now I've got the best model. 
It's not IED-like, it's IED love. I have an explosive model, I cause brain damage in the animal, so I'm, don't me I'm not messing around. I've got the real animal with brain damage from a blast, and then can my nutrition work? So what we do is we have rats on different diets, low zinc diet or adequate zinc diet for five weeks, and then we expose them to blast, and then we have them in recovery for uh, 14 days. And along the way, we can do blood, we can do different kinds of mazes, we do testing on these animals. That's the blast tube. And about halfway down the blues, the blue and orange are the Dutch colors. About halfway down, you put this explosive. That is Semtec plastic explosive. You put it in the tube and you detonate it. Half the blast goes this way, half the blast goes that way, and over there is my little rat. We're in the bunker when this happens. So, this is what a rat looks like. He's facing the blast. The blast is going to come from this side. And what you're going to see is a bright white light. Light travels faster than sound. Got it? So that's why when you're running on the track and field, watch the guy with the gun. And when you see the powder, that's light. You're going to see something before you hear the sound. And you, ex and you start, correct? So when we, I'm going to show you a video, and you're going to see that rat's head is taped down to prevent it from whiplash. It's also to protect his whiskers. There's a heat signature. It's about 3,000 degrees F for four milliseconds. So there's a heat wave, and the soldiers will tell you they got like a bright sunburn on their face. And it's gone, it repairs in about five days. But you can't do this with a drop weight where you have a, 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 what they do in Boston and the experiments here where they can't use explosives. Up top is a sensor, there's a sensor placed above the rat's head. And what we're tracking here is what the blast wave looks like. So the video is tracking. That was the white light. The blast wave pushed his head back. And then he recovers his head. Notice how the blast wave pressure continues. Look at the wind in the tunnel. So, so this is, your, your draw, jaw might be on the ground saying, what, what, what the hell was that? But I'm not showing you this out of humor to fascinate you, I'm saying this is the kind of experiment we've got to do to mimic what's going on with our soldiers. And you understand, soldiers won't volunteer for my work. So this is what we do, and then the animal is unconscious while this is happening. He's under anesthesia. So I worked with the company to design this. This little thing is what you get when you go to the ER, and they do a pulse oximeter on your finger. And what this allows me, it puts it around the rat's neck, I can do heart rate, breathing rate, body temperature, pulse distension. I can monitor what's going on. If he got a real hit, then his breathing rate goes down, his heart rate goes down. That's a symptom of physiology, and that's what's tracking here. So bradycardia means your heart slowed down. We got the animals under anesthesia, both groups. These guys didn't get hit. This group, we exposed them to blast, and we're tracking them for about eight more minutes, and we're going to look to here and you see their heart rate decreased. The non-blast animals wake up. The blast animals take longer to wake up. So this helps me measure loss of consciousness. When you're hit on the football field and you're unconscious for 30 seconds, they call it a mild TBI. More than 30 seconds, they call it a moderate TBI. More than half an hour, they call it a severe TBI. So from my animals, I can get a readout that tells me how long they were unconscious for. And the number here says that they were unconscious for more than 100 seconds longer. So we call that loss of consciousness. This animal was exposed to a blast. Let's go back to that water tank. So we teach the animals to go find the block. But I take the block away. So it's called a retrieval test. Does he remember where to go? And these guys were not exposed to blast. And they're spending all the time. These are two different animals, control animals. And they're swimming and swimming and saying, hey, Angus, where did you put that? Block, I want to get out of the water. Look what happens in animals who are exposed to blast. They give up. So this is what we call suicidal thoughts. He fails to stick to the task. Here, this guy's swimming around looking for the platform. This guy's swimming around and around and around. He doesn't even know why he's in the water. So we're using the rat for a score and we read out. Then I do nutrition intervention and see if we can repair it. And this is how we score it. This is both groups, time to platform. And he told you he gets better. It takes him less seconds to find the block. Look what happens when I move the block. 
new learning. These guys take a bump, and they can't find that hidden platform. But exposed to blast, it takes him much longer to find the new platform. I told you we call this new learning. So the blast affects your ability to learn and acquire new technology. Now we added the low zinc group and the adequate zinc group, and we saw that adding zinc, these guys learned better. Got it? This is time to the platform. Everyone tracked the same. We hit them on the head here. Here's the blast. And these are the guys on the low zinc. They did terrible. These guys did better, and this is the no, non-blast group. We take the brains out, we measure zinc in the brain, because if I want to explain mechanism, I need to measure the tissue where the, did the zinc go into the brain, and is that what caused it? And really, that's what this graph is showing. On the adequate zinc groups, there was higher zinc in the brain. That helps explain mechanism. All right. So I'm wrapping up. I'm telling you that the model was valid. It's good enough to relate to what goes on with a soldier. We got decreased heart rate, we got decreased breathing rate. We had a loss of consciousness that we could measure. There were deficits in memory and learning and problems on a rotor rod. I took a treadmill for rats and I put it up on a hill. Because soldiers tell me, when you talk to the soldier, he says, I'm okay climbing upstairs. But if I have to climb downstairs with a head injury, I struggle with vestibular motor. I, I have trouble balancing. So I took my rat treadmill and I tilted it up like this and made the rat run up a hill and stay on the top. So we measured vestibular motor activity in a rat. And it was affected by blast, which we would expect because soldiers tell me that. Rats on a low zinc diet did much worse than rats on an adequate zinc diet. Um, so we started to look at biomarkers. GFAP is uh, a, a protein in the brain that tells me we've got axonal damage. You have neurons, you have axons. So GFAP was worse in the blast group over the control. It was worse in the low zinc versus adequate zinc. Everything you expect. At 48 hours, which is acute, versus 14 days chronic, the numbers were higher. So we have markers that can tell us we have an animal model that is valid. All right. Um, so what are we, we get into what I'm doing now. So you've seen this comic I drew. We have the soldier exposed to a blast. What can we do before he gets problems? Then I spoke to soldiers, and they said, we were really stressed. In 2003, at the beginning of the war, the truck in front blows up. They go along, the combat medics jump out, they pull the guy out of a burning vehicle and they help him. Then the terrorists, the bad guys got smart and they start shooting our guys. So now, the rules are, the truck in front blows up, you engage it from behind, you push it a mile down the road. It's burning, the guy is screaming in front of you. You push it out of the kill zone because they're gonna kill you as well. That's where we are today. So I said, what's that like to be in that truck? He said, it's really stressful. I haven't slept. It's 112 degrees, I haven't eaten well, and I haven't spoken to my girlfriend in a week. You know, he's worried about everything. So the question we're looking at now is, what's the effect of stress? And how do I do stress in an animal? I can put him in a bucket of water on a platform during the daytime, when it's good for my technicians, and we can do sleep deprivation. Every time he falls asleep, the bucket tilts and he falls in the water. So that's what's studied, that's what they publish. There's a problem with that for me because your rat fell in six times and my rat fell in once. So your guy might have hypothermia from the cold water. So what we decided, we went through different iterations, different ways of doing stress in an animal. So we have a system where we use for stress, we put them in a tube. It's a plastic tube for immobilization. They can't move. It's really restrictive. And that simulates they're sitting in a vehicle and they can't get out. The rats hate it. They will bite you. They can see their mates, but they can't get out of this tube. So we simulate that for two hours, and then we hit them on the head. So the question we've asked is, what does stress do to mild TBI? Does stress make mild TBI look like moderate TBI? Think of you guys when you take exams. It's known in America that 14% of students, college students get diarrhea during exams because of stress or not managing stress well. So if there's something we can do for stress management, it might help our soldiers. So this is what we're doing this year. We take rats that are above 350 grams. We're not talking about 12-year-old children. A 350-gram rat is almost an adult. So the, the, the skull has changed from cartilaginous tissue 
to old guy's brain tissue. We put him in immobilization stress for two hours a day, we expose him to blast, and then we, we keep them alive for a while, and we see if stress makes it worse. And these are the different things we measure. Our work is different. I'm looking for readouts. I told you this is like doing pediatrics, where the patient doesn't tell you what's going on. So our rats live in a cage like this with a voluntary running wheel. Because remember, who's my customer? I've got to go back and talk to the army doctor and say, zinc worked for the following reasons in a rat, but his customer is a soldier. How does it relate? So we can track running every day, 24 seven. And the guys are running about five kilometers a day. That's how fast they run. I'm not doing dog years times by seven. This is rats running five kilometers a day. There's the two groups. Then I expose them to stress, these guys stop running. Then I hit them on the head, and then they all bounce back up. <clears throat> what we're looking for is if I add nutrition supplements in recovery. Here's the guy recovering from a head blast. Can I speed up recovery? This is return to duty. Can you guys get back on the field if I give you a supplement in your recovery from TBI? So what we're doing is we're looking at, I want to show you what we're doing. I import this drink. It's got omega-3, it's got vitamin D. I import this from Norway. It's called Smartfish. And the kids drink it in Norway, and it, the omega-3 does what? So you guys know about, about polyunsaturated fatty acids in your blood. It's in your diets. You guys cook with corn oil. You go to McDonald's, you get corn oil food. It's got N6s. Those are bad. They give you heart disease. Fish oil gives you N3, which is healthy, DHA and EPA. So what I'm trying to do is, if I bash you on the head, and I break down this whole big wall of N6, I want to replace it with N3. I want to put in fish oil supplementation. The vitamin D is important because Florida. All the grandmas in Florida listen to what the doctors say, and they cover themselves up with sunscreen when they go out. And they have a vitamin D deficiency. They're not getting enough sunlight. As a result of vitamin D deficiency, there's dementia, and there's depression. Our soldiers get that as well. So we're doing combination foods. Where we are today is this guy has this fancy chemical that works on pathway A. He has a fancy food on pathway B. He has a fancy food, she has a fancy food on pathway C. And I'm saying maybe the combination foods will stimulate the different pathways. So that's what we're doing. We're doing omega-3, I explained. We're doing zinc because of the studies we've done and we're adding vitamin D3. I added another ingredient. Glutamine helps you with leaky gut. When a blast injury comes along, the gut gets ripped, and you put blood. It's not nice. So I don't care if you give me Ben and Jerry's and you say Ben and Jerry's is gonna fix my brain. If the gut is ripped and I can't f absorb the food properly, then the Ben and Jerry's isn't gonna work. So we add glutamine to the diet to fix the gut first. Then the vitamin D will, I told you, for depression and dementia. The zinc, I told you, because it fixes everything. And the omega-3 is to rebuild that wall, to rebuild the brain, crosses the blood-brain barrier. So those are the studies we're doing now. And I got cute. We do the studies before, the diet before for nine weeks. We do the study in recovery for a month. And we gave it a fancy name, AIDM, anti-inflammatory dietary mix. So what we're looking at is if the brain gets hit, that's the primary injury. No nutrition is going to help you. What the nutrition is supposed to do is to prevent the body response, the secondary response, which is neuroinflammation. So the diet has to be anti-inflammatory. So if I give it a fancy title, AIDM, anti-inflammatory diet, then I can add anything. Someone else comes up with a new invention tomorrow, I can add it to my cocktail. So we're doing, this starts next month. We're doing pre-injury anti-inflammatory diets supplemented with zinc, vitamin D, and omega-3 to improve resiliency. That's a big word, same as the diarrhea. If I gave you a little bit of Shigella diarrhea when you lived in New Hampshire, and you had the poop for a week, I promise you, when you got to Afghanistan, you wouldn't have any diarrhea, because you've seen it before. When kids go to Jamaica, the first time they get, I told you, Giardia diarrhea. The second time they go, because you have what's called memory cells. Your body remembers what you were exposed to before. You have antibodies, memory cells, that will protect you the second time. Okay. <clears throat> so this is my protocol now. We're doing stress. 
We're exposing them to the blast, and then we're doing the supplementation. How do I do explosives in Natick? I'm not. We take our rats in a U-Haul truck, and we drive down the highway. So look out next time you see a U-Haul truck on the interstate. It might be me with 40 rats in my truck. <laughs> we go down to Camp Edwards, which is on Cape Cod, and they have a range. And they're putting a stick about this high with a grenade on the end. My, I have rats at 40 feet, and I have rats at 60 feet, and I have rats at 80 feet. So maybe I'll kill them all the first time. I hope not. We have, we have algorithms to determine. But this way, I will have rats with a severe injury, a moderate injury, and a mild injury. And maybe these guys up front here need Ben & Jerry's plus maple syrup, plus everything else. And the guys at the back just need a dark room. So we're scaling the injury. We're using real IED explosives. OK. So I've spoken enough and my mouth is dry. Thank you guys for your attention, for staying awake with me and staying up with me. So we can talk about what we did on diarrhea in Kenya, that I got to travel. I went to live in the Netherlands for 18 months and learn how to use explosives. And all of it is to make, create, and be creative and come up with soldier-specific benefits of my research. Does this help male and females? Um, a, a little bit of FYI, girls will repair faster than boys from a TBI, because it's progesterone. Our soldiers refuse to take progesterone injections, even in the spacecraft, in the International Space Station. We've told them that progesterone will help preserve the estrogens, will help preserve lean body mass. And this, the astronauts are saying, hell no, we will not take um, any feminizing hormones. But on your side, it's plus, is that girls will repair faster than boys. Cool? All right. Um, I'm not going to slam American football. I just think we play rugby in my country, and we have less injuries. We don't wear helmets in rugby, and we have less traumatic brain injury than American football. So our soldier helmets are that's my show and tell. Okay? Our soldier helmets are designed um, to protect you from a certain kind of bullet in there. They're not designed for blast. So co-located with where I work, can you guys see this? It's a rat helmet. Okay. <laughs> It's made with ACH material, advanced combat helmet material, which is Kevlar and Mylar. And I took them a dead rat, a frozen rat, and they manufactured me a helmet. But I'm not using this helmet to protect my rat. When I do an injury, and I put the helmet on the guy, I, and I drop a weight on here. For those non-blast studies, I drop a weight on here. When I open his head up, I don't want a red spot, meaning it's focal. It's a very directed injury. I want a diffuse injury. So the idea of this helmet, it's one of a kind, but it's, the idea of this is to have a diffuse injury. So I think you can tell I love my job, and I thank you and your parents for paying taxes that pay my salary. Do I ever do human testing? Um, so that's kind of important. We got a new one-star general on the base, and he met me, and he said, Angus, I love what you're doing. This is exciting. Who's your customer? So I've identified a group of 450 soldiers down at Fort Belvoir, just south of DC. And these guys are active duty. They're still employed. We haven't kicked them out of the army. And they, they're, they're, they don't sleep at night, and they got all kinds of problems because of blast. So I went down to talk to the physician in charge of that program, and she was absolutely convinced my study would work. And then she intrigued me. She said, I, I don't care about your study. Jump in tomorrow. Start tomorrow. I would love you to come. She said, I want to know what happens when you stop giving them the supplement. Do all the symptoms come back? So they go back to the American diet, and they get the N6s, and they low on vitamin D, and they low on zinc. Do the things, the deficits they have now, the problems they have now, do they all come back? I'm cautious. One, I don't do well with humans. But I'm cautious about doing a human study a major study ran out of Emory University four years ago. Dr. Donald Stein had shown that progesterone, female rats repair better, progesterone and vitamin D is magic. It repairs. And he got a boatload of money from the NIH. And the study was stopped after one year. He took people who got hit six weeks ago and people who got hit six years ago. He took 60-year-old people and he took six-year-old people, males, females, active, non-active. He just said, this is magic, it's going to help everyone. And it was so diverse. 
If you got hit six years ago, you've probably learned how to walk properly. You've probably overcome, you've activated another part of your brain. So I've asked in these active duty soldiers, 450, I only want 80. And I want specific, only give me males, or only give me females, only give me guys who were hit within the last six months. It's actually really difficult to work with young male soldiers because you were hit when you were 16 in football and 17 in wrestling. Young girls typically have never been hit on the head until they get to college and, and start hitting the ball. So I want to work in Worcester with the seven colleges and work with the women's team of soccer players. I can study them before they start their careers and then at the end of the season and give half of them the drink. Now there's an ethical problem. If I know it works, then how can I not? I've got half the girls, two teams, and I give this one a placebo and I give this one my fancy drink from Norway. Is it unethical, knowing this stuff works in my rats, to not give her the benefit? So the way to answer that is to give her a 1x dose and give her a 2x dose. More is not always better. 2x might be real expensive, 1x, you, you understand what I'm saying? So you've got to work through those ethics. I, I work in animal care and they don't have lawyers. And you see the nasty stuff I do to rats. Working with humans in America is real expensive and, and difficult. But that is my customer, so I've got to find the physicians to talk to to convince them that the animal success story in animals might translate. Thanks for your question. Please. Um, you talked a lot about nutrition and biochemistry. What about people who are interested in other fields of science? Could you give a little snapshot about how the other fields of science might apply um, to have, whether it be health in the military or government in general? Other kinds of science. So. Um, or math, those kinds of things. So for people who maybe chemistry isn't their thing, but. Okay, so we've got a modeling guy in our building who's a stats geek. And um, you I was given that example earlier. You understand that when your boat tips over off Cape Cod, it's really expensive to get out three boats and a helicopter to look for you. But if you're chubby like me and you fell in the water, maybe my body fat keeps me alive longer in 54 degree temperature. If you're skinny, maybe you die earlier. What were you wearing? How far away from the boat were you? So he's done mathematical modeling of that. And the Coast Guard of the United States uses his model, and now the Navy is looking at it this month. Because it's search and rescue or search and recovery. That's just one boat looking for a body floating in the water, and the sharks haven't eaten it. So to get back our Navy person alive is really important, but expensive. So which way was the current going? Which way was the wind blowing? Was he in a buoyant jacket? Was he in a, just a raft? So um, Zhao Feng Zhu put together this whole model. So that's a math geek with coming up with a model to help the Coast Guard and it'll help all, all the people who get on boats and go to Cape Cod. So that's one example. Um, I told you we have hot chambers and we have cold chambers. So we know what to drink, how much Gatorade to drink when it's 126 degrees in Baghdad. We know that. But now there might be a chemical bomb. You gotta put on what's called a mop suit. Normally here today, you can wear that suit for 20 minutes. But what happens in Baghdad when it's 126 degrees? So we can simulate that here on our property and advise the guy, you're only doing 10 minutes in, it takes you an hour to get in the suit, but you can only work for 10 minutes. So they do those active experiments and then give feedback. <clears throat> when you go to altitude and you work at altitude, our helicopters can get up to about 11, 12,000 feet but the mountains in Afghanistan can get as high as 14,000 feet. So if you're wounded at 14,000 feet, we have to bring you back down the mountain. We have a different problem. We send our soldiers to chase bad guys, and the bad guy is a billy goat, and he runs up a mountain. And he does well, because he was born and raised there. Our guys came from Hanover, New Hampshire. Our guys don't know how to climb and run up and down mountains. And we get hit with AMS, acute mountain sickness. To get you off a mountain because you can't breathe, cost the army a boatload of money. So we have genetics people looking at the genes. Is there a gene that in this whole room, there might only be one person with, who's susceptible to AMS? So can we say, he's not going, he's gonna get a, be a truck driver. 
Everyone else goes up the mountain, but he's a truck driver. So there's g genetic stuff. Um, I, so I'm just trying to give you a, a variety of things. So we have thermal mannequ mannequins as well. North Face recently came on the property. North Face has a new glove. When you come in and you sell new gloves to the army, that's a billion dollar business, that the army is buying your gloves. You now go to REI and sell it, or Dick Sports and sell it and say, this is what's used by the US Army. That's awesome, you got big sales. But the army has two requirements, that it is better than and cheaper than what they currently have. So they come and use our system, we have a mannequin, we put the glove on with thermal couples inside to measure temperature. And then we put it in the cold. We can't do snow, but we can do freezing rain. We can go down to about minus 40 F, and it is frigid, with in-ground treadmills for 40 soldiers to hike in the cold. And then we say, this is what you gotta eat, or this is what you gotta wear. These socks work, these socks don't work. So that type of work. I have a buddy who's a biomechanics guy, and he's comparing backpack loads. Everything, it costs the army a boatload of money when every, people complain about low back pain and we have no way to fix low back pain. So can we adjust where the backpacks go? So that's a biomechanics. He went to WPI. Um, we like WPI, they, they produce good students. Um, all right, my veterinarian is a vet DVM veterinarian and a PhD, smart guy. He's my captain, he works for me, and he does a PTSD rat. And what I want to tell you about is why he's in the army. He's a smart kid. Well, after undergraduate, then PhD, then veterinary school at Virginia Tech, he had $187,000 in debt. And I don't know about you guys, you live in Northboro, but to me that's a lot of money to pay back student loans for 20 years or so. So he joined the army. He pays $400 a month repayment. After 10 years in the army, 10 times 12 times 400, he'll have paid back about 50,000 of that debt, of 187,000. The army will do debt forgiveness. The army will pay for him to, uh, to pay off his debt. So we kind of bought him. He's a veterinarian, he's never gonna get deployed. So there's the army, you can have a career. We have a medical school in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, the nutritionists, the dietitians who work for me all have master's degrees paid for by the army. They're the best paid grad students in America. They get $47,000 a year and you're in school full time. You're going to grad school. Um, all right, um, I, I was, just a personal note, I was water skiing last year and I bust my hip. And I, they've rebuilt my hip and I use PTs and OTs to recover. And I'm walking, I'm doing fine. But in my building we have OTs and PTs. So I could check in with these guys. All of them have degrees through the US Army, through Baylor University, paid for by the US Army. And they're as good as the civilians, they're fantastic. All right, um, Miss Honey. Any last question? That's it. So thank you for your attention. I do have one last note. I didn't show you a slide from Kenya. When I was here about 10 years ago, they had a crazy penny drive. I don't know how that works. And they gave me a check for like $700. Algonquin High School gave me a check for $700. So I arrive in Kenya and I look around and I said, how are we gonna spend this money? They said, Angus, go spend this money in Kenya. And I'll tell you at the hospital across from where we work, they just have a pit in the ground. And every Friday they pour gasoline on and they burn medical waste. So we went online to the United Nations and I found how to make a kiln, how to make an incinerator. So we threw the concrete block, we got the bricks from Egypt, we built an incinerator and they put the, it's a bag about this big can go in, fill it with medical waste. And it's paid for by you guys. Your school paid for an incinerator in Kenya. It was awesome, the people now, I, I was then a goat is inside the, this trash tank with medical waste. And I, you saw how much HIV and how much malaria and hepatitis and all the other tropical diseases. So your guys were so cool, they built, they gave me, the, they trusted me, and they, we built an incinerator, and I was so proud to say, hey, those are my boys. Well, I, you're not my boys, but you, I knew you guys, and <laughs> you, had, you had helped. Uh, so, so um, how do you say, kudos to you guys. Thanks, thanks so much, and thanks for your attention today.